Hello, and welcome to another Bristlecone broadcast. I'm Michael Lean, VP of Sales and Marketing here at Bristlecone. And today I have with me two of my colleagues, Jen Chu, who is the VP of Solutions and Consulting. She has over 30 years of experience in supply chain, and joining her is Shipra Sharma, VP of Analytics and AI. She has 20 years of experience of analytics and AI, and yes, AI has been around for that long. They're going to tell us a little bit about that in a moment. So, Jen, Shipra, what are you two seeing in the market? Specifically, how are customers responding to this moment of AI? Even though AI has been around for a long time, it seems like this year is when everybody's talking about it. So what are you seeing? So why don't I start? Um, what I've been seeing out there is a lot of misunderstanding about the term AI. So first, it's probably worth clarifying that AI has indeed been around for 30 or 40 years when you consider things like machine learning and analytics and um, sort of the programmatic approach to AI. What's new and what caused all the buzz was really the deployment of gen AI or generative AI in the marketplace where all of a sudden you really didn't need a programmer out there to um, define it so rigidly. Um, and so that's caused um, a lot of business leaders, not technologists, right, to get excited and start to see the uh, impact that AI could have on their organization in a way that didn't really capture sort of the zeitgeist that um, AI really had up until the deployment of ChatGPT4. You agree with that? Yes. And I'd also say that uh, for the longest time, it was all about trying to understand what Gen AI is, right? I mean, part of it was the buzz, then it settled down and it said, okay, now how can I use it? Because eventually it comes down to how do you monetize the technology? And uh, it came down to a point when things, a lot of us experimented, uh, ourselves included, the services vendors in, included, and a lot of us experimented only finally to raise up our hands and say, okay, enough experimentation. I don't know how to monetize this technology yet. So I think I'm going to wait on somebody to do that. So now there is, I'd see the market is divided into a set of uh, enterprises which are truly wanting to innovate, get the more out of LLMs, try to build their own LLMs, train it. And then another side, which is waiting to be fast followers. I think the big question is, can you be, can you afford to be a fast follower? And that's still a question at large, but that's how I see the enterprises uh, approaching this, this new technology, these new puzzles. Right. So, so those fast followers, if I may, Michael, they're really waiting for the SAPs or the sales forces to integrate AI into the larger enterprise application packages. And, you know, um, so you, it's hard to differentiate yourself if AI adoption in your organization really means waiting for, for it to be part of the dual solution from SAP. That's well and good for, you know, probably the core, right? The stuff that is consistent um, or non-differentiating, but um, it doesn't help set you apart as an innovative leader. And that's really the bifurcation we're starting to see in the marketplace. Well, it seems like with Salesforce, SAP, you just mentioned too, they always say their solutions is not just a co-pilot. But is that true or is it just a co-pilot? And when I think of co-pilot, I just think of a easier way to search, right? I mean, what are these things really doing? What, what's the benefit? Uh, so yeah, let me take that. I think co-pilot as you and I are exposed to as end customers is search because that's what co-pilots are, right? Microsoft co-pilot helps you search better, but it could have a broader meaning where you could almost by extension say, hey, tomorrow the co-pilots can do configurations for you. So the user interface of a co-pilot, the same user interface that you are asking for a search and it connects you to the web and to all the activities, the same user interface, instead of having implementation services team, could you have a co-pilot guide you through very, very nuanced and complex configuration, uh, again, just through just through a conversational stream where you can write, hey, uh, can you put my configuration to make to order 
for so much of free time for such kind of a product category and it actually goes and uh, executes in this, into the system so it can it can vary from a simple search all the way to doing some complex nuanced uh, domain specific transactions and going back taking it in a natural language and going back and executing i mean that's the that's the spectrum of copilot and that's why most likely sap says and many of them are claiming it's not just a search engine or just a search code but it can do a lot of other things as well yeah you're even starting to see examples like when you type an email now and you start to get like not just suggestions for what the next word is but what the next what the rest of the sentence should be and it's context uh, aware so you could start to see how with the larger enterprise application vendors and they've got a lot of context because they know that you're in a particular process or in a um, you know, completing a particular activity so they could be much smarter much faster in terms of, of saying it looks like you're trying to do this would you like some help and that goes beyond search and really starting to try to um, help you better execute right the business task at hand Okay. And I, I can see the utility of that, but I mean, it really just seems it's helping me do better queries and saves me a bit of time, but that doesn't really make me a leading edge innovative mm -hmm. company. So how are those companies using AI then? Yeah, so now you're getting into what are the specific use cases for those innovative leading edge companies, right? Where are they starting to jump out ahead of the fast follower organizations? So for example, um, speaking with uh, a life sciences company recently, and they um, have identified a couple of different use cases. One in the regulatory space where, you know, they've got to deal with being able to address right all the regulations across the you know 160 different countries that they um, deliver to, and that's a lot of different regulations. They're all coming out on different cycles, and some of them are quite nuanced. So um, having a um, an engine set up right to do that analysis for them, and then um, suggest changes in the process you know ahead of time that prevent them from getting into you know, any sort of regulatory issue ahead of time. So pretty straightforward to, to set up, right? There's a defined set of sources. Um, so that one's pretty easy, right? Low on the maturity, but certainly um, high on the benefits case. The second um, example from this same life sciences company is um, they've got in their existing SAP environment, uh, a couple hundred custom planning reports that they've already built and deployed in their organization. Uh, and they've got an army of planners that are out there looking at the results of those planning reports on a regular basis. And then those planners get together and take actions. Is there a way for Gen AI to do that analysis ahead of time and suggest corrective actions based on the already customized um, reporting, right? A big investment to develop and deploy those reports. Um, and then can we free up the planners um, to say, yes, that's a good action. No, that's a bad action. Um, and actually accelerate the execution of better decisions than they otherwise would have because they're no longer spending the time to just figure out what those 200 or 300 or 400 reports are actually telling them. Got it. I think another perspective, Michael, could also be that what is your mindset, right? As an enterprise, what do you want to do? Is it the efficiency play, which most likely 99% of the enterprises and organizations are going to go after because it's going to be more enterprise, it's going to be most of your software vendors are going to come up with those, uh, you know, mass enterprise AI kind of use cases, which are very, very directly going to save you either time or cost or resources, basically a cost play. The other side of it is I, I like to take examples. Now there are many examples, but early on, I really like the way Bloomberg moved, right? Uh, they actually took on a top line play. They actually took on a differentiation, differentiation play. They actually took on to say, I'm going to build my own LLM because I sit on a lots of property data that nobody else has, right? So they sit on a lot of financial securities, uh, commodities, exchange, all sorts of analyst reports and data, which nobody else has. And they took on a, they took on a position to say that the you, I'm going to train my own, own LLM. I'm going to put a business value proposition uh, around that and I'm going to monetize it, right? Mm -hmm. So they have come out with a Bloomberg GPT uh, very early on, actually. That example is, uh, is a little bit outdated, I feel. And there are many companies right now, the regulatory one is a good example. But now they become the leading uh, 
product software solution plays, monetizing the LLMs on the top of the data that only, by the way, either they as an enterprise own or the industry owns. And that's a huge value to the industry, to the enterprise, uh, to everything. And not to mention, I think some of the technologists would also agree, it's a far lesser compute, far lesser ask on NVIDIA chips, far lesser ask on, on your uh, lots of hyperscaler compute resources and doing generally good to the world when you, when you are building your own enterprise LLMs. So I think there's also use case and then there is another place. How do you want to, how do you want to play this game? Do you want to be a cost player? Do you want to be a differentiation player? Do you want to be a, a purely, uh, you know, innovative industry, cutting edge LLMs on your own right? Build, build those on your, in your own right. So a lot of customers that I speak to, at least, they, they understand they need to do AI. Their culture has been one that it, it's really, if it's not broke, why fix it? But they recognize the need that they need to move there. So as a collective group, maybe the decision makers, they weren't born with, with around AI. How did those people get started? So they're like, I'm not the guy who's gonna bring my company into the next generation with AI. I understand the need, I need to bring someone from the outside in, but I don't wanna get into this situation where I have all these consultants coming around spending a ton of money, it's like a, a black pit. I'm just throwing money at the problem. What are smart, discreet ways I can get started so that my enterprise doesn't get left behind while fully acknowledging that maybe I'm not the one to do it. I, I need the outside help, but I want I want things to follow or things to look out for so I don't make a colossal mistake and waste lots of money. Yeah, the, the holy grail of OCM, right? Right. How do you drive adoption and, um, and it's even more complex now when people are very worried that their that AI is going to um, take their job away from them. And so I think companies have a, a massive challenge in front of them to help the individual end user think about how does AI help them do their job better rather than um you know, program them out of a job. Um, and that's a big cultural shift for organizations. Um, it's, it requires organizations to think differently about what the organization itself should look like. What are the new jobs, um, right? In that planning example that I mentioned earlier, it means the role of the planner is fundamentally changing from somebody who does analysis of reports to somebody who is recommending actions. And um, that's a big shift for organizations to think about everything from, right, do I empower my, uh, uh, my users to make decisions or am I expecting them actually just to be good analysts. And that good analyst role is quickly going to go away. And we're really looking at humans as the key decision maker. Um, so massive shift for organizations in terms of how they think about their talent. Hmm. Are you, I'm just going to get a little controversial. So I think I've, I've gone to all these companies and I have almost always, Michael, I mean, you are portraying a picture where the, where the exec or the team says, hey, we need help. How do I get help? Right? Yeah. I've had different, I've seen exactly the opposite. I've seen in a conference room or in a meeting, the business and the ID sitting and business saying, hey, I, we need this. We, this is cool. I want this to solve. And the ID, and again, not to put ID on the spot. I mean, <laughs> some, uh, I think the technologists, let's say, are like, hey, we have figured it out. We, we don't need help. So I think my 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 suggestion, strong suggestion would be, Actually, first to acknowledge that it's almost impossible to stay current with, with particularly this trend. So which means what? That you not just stay current and that part of it is organizational change. Everybody in the organization contributes towards staying current, staying updated, being aware and ready to change, but also needing the help that you need from an ecosystem. You can't do it alone. So you are developing an ecosystem. You are going to uh, lean on that ecosystem, whether it's services vendors, whether it's software players, if you have chosen to say, I'm going to wait on uh, the big software players to come out with their Einstein's and Jules, that's fine. But you are you are going to need that ecosystem of software players. You are going to need that ecosystem of industry players, the Bloombergs of the world, because you are going to wait on them to build some industry, um, I'm not getting the right word, but industry, disruptive industry uh, LLM, right? Say, or solution, LLM solution. So weave that ecosystem around you and lean on to them. And before that, acknowledge that that you need all that 
all that help from different players, including your own talent, including your own organization, including. So I think I think the problem is committed a little differently. The way I see it play around in the boardrooms, I'd say, but I'll not generalize it. I'm pretty sure there are smart companies out there doing just the right thing as well. Okay, so here's a here's a quick lightning round before we wrap this up. You mentioned that you know you you can't just sit around and do nothing. You got to do something. In the past, we've seen fast the fast following strategy work. You know, let everybody else prove it out. Let them make the mistakes, so I can just do the right things. But you've also said that things are moving very fast. So, what is your message to those companies that may want to adopt a fast follower strategy? And you, you only got three sentences for them. What would you say, Shipper? Hmm. Three sentences for fast follower. Okay. I think first is strategy and alignment to know if you want to be a fast follower or not, or do you want to lead in the industry? So that clarity of thought at an executive level is super important, right? Uh, second thing is get your talent ready. You, you really need the entire organization to rally around this. It cannot be one person's job. It cannot be IT's job. It cannot be business job. And the third thing is lean on what I said, probably in my, just my last statement, build that ecosystem. You are not going to game it all by yourself. You get your service line, uh, vendors lined up. You get your software vendors uh, identified. You get your key champions who are going to experiment the use cases for you lined up. And then you actually program, manage, and see the evolution. And, and you iterate fast and fail fast. I mean, that ideology isn't going away or fail fast because particularly technology is changing. But I'd say that be ready more than ever to fail fast, experiment and fail fast with this core team of or ecosystem that 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 I'm saying. So I would add to that that I think the fast follower is fine for organizations in areas that are non-differentiated. If you're only a fast follower across the board in everything that you do, I don't think you'll be around in 20 years. Um, I think you have to be a leader in areas that are differentiating within your industry or I really don't think that the organization is likely to survive in the long haul because your competitors are looking for ways to differentiate and that's where they're going out and not following the, the fast follower approach and rather they're going out and being innovative. innovative. And they have the tools, they have the technology. This time yeah. around, it's a level playing field for everybody. So yeah, I, I agree. Well, Jen, Shipra, thank you so much for joining me. To everybody watching at home, if you would like to speak to these intellectual giants of AI analytics consulting, OC, we can make it happen. Just drop us a note, info at bristlecone.com, and we'll set up a call. To everyone watching, thank you for joining me, and we'll catch you next time.